over there. Please come in. You're right on time. The door only opens when the clock strikes midnight. Georgia and Hannah are preparing to broadcast from the Belfry. Just like this old bell tower, they have many stories to tell. Some old and some new. Follow me up these stairs, but mind your step. Ah, they're waiting for you. Recording in progress. It's Thursday night. Shayna and I are playing Stardew, you know, FaceTiming and playing Stardew. And I'm in bed, so I'm not wearing any pants. And Sarah left that bag of chocolate covered pretzels, right, after Call of Cthulhu. And I was eating them. There wasn't that many left, but I was eating them in bed. Shayna got up to go to the bathroom or something. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go just shut down the the house real quick because it was getting kind of late and I'd had that feeling you know when you can just tell that you're like sitting on something and it's like your phone charger it kind of felt like that and I got up (laughs) it's just like brown smears all over my bed sheets and I was like oh my god what the fuck and I dropped one of these pretzels (laughs) <laughs> and it just looked like I sharded all over the bed and I got up and I was like in the mirror because I was looking at my ass because like here's my butt going in and there's chocolate like on either side of my crack on my cheeks and I was like oh my god and I'm oh, like god. standing there in the mirror like, essentially wiping my ass, and Shannon comes back in, and he sees me, and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, listen, I sent him a Snapchat of the pretzel. Let me see if I still have a picture of it. Oh my god. Oh, I could have texted you right then and there, but I thought it'd be way better to tell you on here. Thank you. For everyone else's enjoyment. Thank you. (laughs) So that's the story of my pretzel shark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's insane. I don't know that that's ever happened. To you. <laughs> like, I've dropped something with chocolate in a place and it's melted and been like, oh, that's weird. But never, like, have I then sat on it with no pants on and it's yeah. been on my cheeks, you know? Never yeah. have I had to wipe my ass of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, just a reminder for all the listeners that you can interact with us on Spotify by answering those fun questions. And you can join our Facebook group and post your comments and questions. And also, we're now on YouTube. Uh, we are on YouTube. YouTube. Uh. <laughs> that was for you, Dad. <laughs> I know you're listening. I think maybe my dad might listen if it's on YouTube. My dad likes to sit. My dad's idea of relaxing is uh, surfing YouTube on his tablet. Honestly, same. I can't even say anything. I love YouTube. Let's remember that my dad didn't know how to use a tablet a year ago. <laughs> True. I want to get deep for a second before we deep. really get into this, especially like How this, deep? this topic, I think is, you know, there's like ethics and stuff involved here. I mentioned in my Frankenstein episode about how I'd reanimate Lovecraft and it reminded me of one of uh, Chris's comments. Shout out to Chris for the comments that they have been sending in. Hell yes. Hell yeah. It reminded me of one of their comments and I just wanted to bring up how hard it is to be a a fan of horror and also be aware of how many tropes in horror how much of horror is derived from cultural appropriation yes and i think one of my favorite things about us doing this podcast is we're essentially creating a space where we can 
talk about it and reconcile that within ourselves and have a conversation about it that feels important and educate others who might not be aware of a horror trope being offensive to a group of people i think yeah that's that's a lot of fiction it's drawing inspiration Mm -hmm. from real life to make their shit more interesting which unfortunately that also includes a lot of really terrible things i look like the fucking sun (laughs) i look like the sun baby from the teletubbies you're the light of my life i am the lord jesus christ and i have come (laughs) down to to shine my light on you oh my god kind of on that note like I said, I think it'll be especially present in this episode. So I first wanted to acknowledge something that people in the archaeological community may or may not have seen towards the beginning of last year. And that's the press about museums, especially British ones, the British one, um, changing their language. And I think this got blown out of proportion a lot by like internet trolls who are like, you can't turn, you can't use the word mummy anymore and repeating that museums are banning the use of that word. And I think it's important to clarify that the reality is that a lot of museums recognize that by saying mummy, it feels like you're talking about a thing or maybe a supernatural monster, thanks to pop culture. So by just saying mummified remains, it's a really small change that can remind other people that this is a person. And I think a lot of people especially people who are used to dealing with human remains on a somewhat regular basis might sometimes forget that. And I know we have to emphasize that at work sometimes with people, uh, especially if they don't interact with remains as much as other people might. So I haven't had much experience interacting with human remains. I mean, I shouldn't have to interact with human remains as much as I do. I mean, I still don't do it a lot, but it shouldn't be as much as I do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> even if I need something to be confirmed, the anxiety that I have when I'm like holding it in my hands, I'm just like, I won't forget about you. I'll make sure something happens to you. Don't worry. <laughs> anyway, the irony of that coming from the British Museum. Yeah, you would think that they would. Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole about the British Museum and repatriation. And there's something Mm -hmm. called the British Museum Act of 1963, which forbids both the British Museum and the Natural History Museum from disposing of, I think they might mean deaccession, anything from their collections except in a small number of special circumstances determined on a case-by-case basis. It's kind of like how the Smithsonian still has a ton of stuff because they're not allowed to deaccession anything. Unless, like, repatriated, yeah. Yeah, I think it might be similar. And it seems like... So the museum's deaccession policy states that the board of trustees can't return any object unless it's a duplicate, it's damaged, or if it's unfit to be retained within the collection, whatever that means. Whatever that means. I think we can all guess what that means. Yeah. An article I read about this featured an associate law professor who specialized in cultural property And she commented that at the time of the law being written, no one was thinking about repatriation in the 60s, which I would say I'm sure some people were thinking about it. (laughs) I'm sure. Maybe they didn't have the loudest voices, but they were sure thinking about it. Right. You know, the people whose stuff it was were probably thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But allegedly this came into being as an attempt to prioritize safekeeping of the collections so that they would be above political government, uh, governmental concerns, which makes sense. So like cultural items weren't being used to barter in diplomatic situations, for example. But it seems like what has happened is that people then started taking advantage of this law to get out of doing any real repatriation, Mm. um, which is interesting. The article quotes the museum itself not one person but to the museum as saying we operate within the law and we're not going to dismantle our great collection as it tells a unique story of our common humanity and this was in regards to the parthenon marbles but 
in 2009, the government allowed an exception for Nazi looted art to be repatriated. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> interesting. I just want to do that tongue click. Interesting. The article was from a year ago, and it also talks about how if the Labour Party wins the next general election um, next year, then this law might actually be changed. And Jeremy Corbyn, who would be uh, head of the Labour Party, has already said that he would return the Parthenon marbles. Slay. So we'll see. I'm for, obviously, countries controlling their own cultural heritage. I What I would love to see, and this might still have some not great implications, maybe, I don't know, it would have to be done correctly. I would love to see, you know, the traveling exhibits, like King Tut, they put Tut in a traveling exhibit. If that exhibit was designed and managed and controlled by Egypt, cool. And if they're not willing to do that, then I have to get off my ass and go to Egypt to go see it, you know, like, yep. and contribute to the tourism economy. <laughs> I was going to mention that I think it's it's kind of it's how do I word this? It's evidence of individualization in such a largely globalized world. Mm-hmm. Like we all want to and it seems like the British Museum also wants to sort of connect all of us humans together as a part of this globe, as a part of a shared history. But I think as a consequence of becoming so globalized, we want to stand out more. We want to share our individual histories and be unique. And because otherwise our cultural histories will die. Yeah. It's like, this is kind of off topic, but it reminds me of how Americans in particular are so I'm 50% Scottish, you know, Mm -hmm. it's because America as a culture has become so, you know, the melting pot. It's become such a conglomeration of bits and pieces of all these different immigrant slash colonial characteristics that it's now going backwards where you're trying to reclaim that part of your identity or your family history to to make you special again, you know? Yeah, I think also poor Americans have such a bad rap because if you call yourself, well, I'm an American, I know exactly what kind of characteristics I think about when someone says, <laughs> yeah. I'm an American. Mm-hmm. And not good ones. Not good ones. They're not good. And I want to be aligned as American. That is what I am. I was born in the United States and I'll probably live here forever until I die. Why would I not want to call myself that? Why would I say, oh, yeah, I'm a mix of like 15 different things, which like low key is true, unfortunately, but I don't align with any part of my heritage that's so far removed from me. Yeah. And I know other people feel very differently. Maybe they still have family overseas or they're, they just want to have that some sort of identity we're all desperate for identity yeah this is something that i had recently talked a lot about with my therapist because of what happened when i went back to england before christmas you know a lot of people over there they're like you're the american one and i'm like i'm not though i grew up here and they're only calling me the american one because of my accent at this point And so when I'm over there, it feels like I'm fake. It feels like I'm not a British person. I don't, I don't know. But when I'm over here, it's like, well, I don't really, culturally, I don't really fit in here either. Like I do because I have to, but it's like. Well, you got used to it because you've lived here longer. It's still not the same. You know, my mom, my mom always says like, I'm too. English to be American and too American to be English. You've culturally assimilated. But I still don't feel like I have. Like, I still don't fit in. I still, there's still British things that I want. I just can't have them or can't do them or they don't fit into living here. I I think there are a lot of people living in America that feel very similar. Yeah, I would assume so. Yeah, coming from all over. Yeah. Or indigenous Americans may also feel the same way. Yeah. They had to grow up 
in an English speaking kind of shitty country yeah that they did not choose while also trying to maintain their identities as native to mm-hmm. this land is it their country or is it not to end on a more fun fact instead of being curators at the british museum they're called keepers oh I like isn't that, that fun i mean like, fuck the british museum but yeah. i like that oh. i mean it's kind of funny because they keep they everything sure do, that they, they should <laughs> But in my mind, I associated it with like being a keeper in Call of Cthulhu or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so um, shall we start off with the origins of Egyptomania? I would love nothing more. Don't mind me. I may be taking notes, as I always do. It is 1798. Napoleon has just annexed Malta and invaded Italy. So he's vibing and he's, you know, he's like, I'm going to be just like Alexander the Great. (laughs) He thinks his next conquest should be Egypt, partly because Alexander conquered Egypt and partly because he thought it would be so fun and quirky to put a damper on British colonization efforts at the time of that region and dominate trade of things like wheat, indigo, gold, sugarcane, and flax. If you could dominate trade on one thing for your own motives, what would it be? Bananas. Ew. No, because it was like a whole thing. You know? I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I would probably choose something. If it didn't have negative um, uh, consequences on like someone's culture or something. I think no matter what I choose, it probably would, because that's just <laughs> capitalism. If you dominate anything in trade, you're just right. going to be negatively affecting somebody. All of this went horribly wrong right from the start. 400 French ships landed near Alexandria, so the, the British sank most of them, basically leaving over 40,000 French soldiers stranded in Egypt. And then a bunch of them died from sickness, too. So in 1799, Napoleon tells everyone, I'm going to I'm going to go be right back, but I'm going to go attempt a coup real quick, basically, is, mm-hmm, is what mm-hmm. he says. Um, so he goes back to France to attempt a coup. Mm-hmm. And by 1801, the Ottomans had come onto the scene and they had kicked out the French and the British, which really embarrassed both of them. Mm-hmm. However, As part of this invasion, Napoleon had with him 167 scientists from various backgrounds. Astronomers, naturalists, doctors, physicists, chemists, botanists, engineers. Uh, He even brought artists along to draw, you know, the depictions of different, you know, plant life and the landscapes and everything. Those were the savants, by the way. It was during this time that a French lieutenant or lieutenant, as we would say in my homeland, saw a stone tablet partially uncovered while strengthening defenses, and he thought it might be important. So he went and notified his general, who notified the savants, who had already established the Egyptian Scientific Institute in Cairo. And it was, of course, the Rosetta Stone, a tablet with three sections of text, each in a different script, Do you remember what they are? Sumerian? No. No, I don't know. What was your question? I was going to say, do you remember that paid subscription service, Rosetta Stone, to learn languages? Yeah, people still use that. Right, really? I thought it was all about Duolingo. No, people still use Rosetta Stone. Okay. No, tell me. Um, Hieroglyphs at the top, ancient Greek at the bottom, and Demotic in the middle. I was going to guess hieroglyphics next, ancient or Egyptian hieroglyphs. Yeah. Hieroglyphs were only understood by Egyptian elite. And then I think demotic would be the script used by administrators. Proclamations. Uh Uh-huh. Proclamations. (laughs) People were having a really hard time deciphering both the of those Egyptian scripts. So having this tablet with the same paragraph written in the three different languages was really beneficial because everyone knew ancient Greek. Yeah, And so this three-year period of scientific exploration by Napoleon Savants really kicked off the Egyptomania mania. 
<laughs> through <laughs> throughout Western Europe. <laughs> and it only intensified in the 1820s when the Rosetta Stone was successfully deciphered. Which I think is interesting because, I mean, normally when I think of Egyptian crazes, I really think of the 20s. But it started 100 years before that. which So it lasted yeah. a long time. Apparently, during this time, there was a striptease act during which mummies were unwrapped by Giovanni Belzoni. Wow. He was an actual strong man. Oh. Uh, also, he was six foot seven. Oh my gosh. He really had no other lot in life besides that. Like, that direction. Yeah. Well, he is really famous in um, this, like, antiquity period of Egypt. I think because he did a lot of uh, mapping. I don't really know how he was qualified to do such a thing. But he did put a lot of places on on the map, you know. Um, He... This is why I asked you this question the other day. He goes on to do some expedition to West Africa, but gets dysentery and dies. So he's probably really bad at playing Oregon Trail. (laughs) (laughs) I was just going to say. Allegedly, our pal Richard Burton (gasps) wrote that Belzoni was actually robbed and murdered. Oh. And I don't know where he got that information uh, but I just thought that was a really fun fact. Burton went a lot of places. He was a freaking world traveler. I know. He loved to talk about it and talk to other people about it and write about it and publish about it and have discussions and be wrong. Mostly be wrong. Well, he was also <laughs> right a lot of the time. He collected a lot of uh, information and evidence. He just summarized it and described things in his own fashion. Horribly incorrectly. Yeah. Sure, sure. For- Direct quotes from people. It's like, oh, I can see where you drew this conclusion. You're kind of weird, though. Yeah. Like, he didn't didn't remove his own cultural bias, that's for sure. He sure did not. My favorite, blah, blah, my favorite, my favorite horrible activity is that of mummy unwrapping dinner parties. Yay. When fancy rich people came back from their vacations in Egypt, they just picked up a mummy or two from the side of the road because people would just straight up have mummies propped up against walls for sale and then invite their friends over to tell them about their trip and and toot their own horns and then make them sit through those slideshows of all their touristy photos, you know? <laughs> And then they just plop a big mummy down on the dinner table and start unwrapping it. When was this happening? The 1800s. Okay. Peak Victorian era. Okay. Well, in the 30s, it started out... I think they really tried to keep up the scientific pretenses. Like, in the 30s, there was one example of a mummy being unwrapped in a theater, you know, like in a surgical theater, how they watched surgery at the time. But after a while, I think they just kind of gave up pretending it was for science because everyone knew. I read this Atlas Obscura quote that says, The same people who thought it vulgar to take off their gloves in mixed company delighted in having a millennia-old corpse divested of its wrappings in front of them. Yeah, it's pretty backwards. But it's so fascinating. We're going to talk about a lot of backwards things today. Yeah. This practice is depicted in a story that I really enjoy. It's by Edgar Allan Poe. It was published in 1845, and it's called Some Words with a Mummy. (laughs) It is a highly satirical short story in which the narrator, who after what is described as a very large amount of Welsh rarebit, uh, which is something we served at the pub I used to work at, and also a large amount of brown stout, like a nice Guinness or two or seven. He falls asleep, so maybe unreliable narrator already. Only to be summoned to his friend's house late at night because he just returned from Egypt and he brought a mummy to unwrap and they're going to do it immediately because why wait till a normal time? Middle of the night is the obvious choice. If we do a little throwback to what I said. Let's do it a couple of episodes ago about the social climate of the Victorian era. So like I said, it's the 1840s. People were still 
riding those waves of ideas. It's been 10 years since the final draft of Frankenstein was published and galvanism and the anatomy act and all that kind of thing. And that's pre- prevalent in this story when the guys decide that they should first try using electricity to reanimate the mummy before attempting dissection. Shockingly, this works. And the mummy, whose name is Alamistakio, <laughs> so satirical, uh, basically scolds them for abusing him and being so dumb and ignorant. And then they have this whole discussion about which of their civilizations is more advanced. And eventually one of the men is like, yeah, we have cough drops. <laughs> what do you think of that? And the mummy's like, uh, you're right. You're, you got me. You're clearly you got superior. Me. <laughs> We have men fall. Like, you wouldn't believe what that shit does. And then the narrator goes home and uh, goes back to the dude's house the next day so he can get embalmed for a couple hundred years himself just to get away from his wife. Yeah, that sounds about right. I also read this story. <laughs> Good. <laughs> in, in prep for the, uh, these episodes just because <gasps> I love Poe. I know. And I think this is one of his lesser known stories, but it's hilarious. Also, the mummy explains that he was embalmed in a different method, and that's why he was able to be reanimated, because he's like a special mummy. One of the things I like about this story is that it's 200 years old, and it still hones in on a lot of things we have to deal with today. Like, the idea that the Western world is the height of civilization, and knowledge with all of its industrial power and science, and completely disregards both other contemporary cultures and ancient civilizations were perfectly capable and intelligent and, you know, calling out those people who think that pyramids were built by aliens. Yes. If you are a frequent watcher of ancient aliens, leave. Or keep I mean, listening. Keep it's listening okay. and take it to heart. Oh, be educated. It's okay if you watch it frequently, as long as you don't actually buy into what they're saying. <laughs> yes. If you watch it frequently to be entertained and make fun of people, that, that's fine. It makes me too angry. I can't watch it. So uh, just to be clear, such beliefs undermine and erase the agency, intellect, and achievements of Native or non-European cultures and implies that only white Europeans are um, capable of that level of architecture or engineering. Yes, we do not believe in hierarchical evolution. No. In this podcast. <laughs> no. Social evolution? No. Looking at you. Shut up. Herbert Spencer. Spencer, Morgan, and Marx. Looking at you, bitches. <laughs> Speaking of dinner parties, let's not forget the ingestion of mummy powder. Oh, I could literally never forget that. Literally never. I think, so there's something called mummia in the Middle East, which was a natural mineral pitch, like a resin or a tar. And this word was also used to refer to bitumen, which today, bitumen, bit, mm. bitumen, bitumen, um, bitumen, <laughs> which today is related to the coal and oil industry, mm-hmm. like a viscous fluid, maybe a, is it a byproduct of crude oil? I can't remember. Anyway, the Egyptians would use this in the embalming process. At some point, I think there was confusion with this word, maybe like another mistranslation or misunderstanding, uh, and it became used to refer to this thick resinous substance that allegedly came from cadavers, and then ultimately for ground up mummies. As gross as the sound, let's have another throwback to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bathory. Yep. <laughs> And some of the medical theories surrounding, you know, her ingesting skull fragments to cure her epileptic seizures or... I loved Chris's comments about Elizabeth Bathory, by the way. They were great. The one I can remember off the top of my head was, well, 50 some deaths in 20 years isn't that bad. I'm like, you know what? You're kind of right. Which I did kind of say that, to be fair. But I'm glad they agree with me. Yes, (laughs) So both of these things are considered medicinal cannibalism, which is a cool term. Oh, yeah, it is. And we just talked about cannibalism. Yeah, we did. And we're going to talk more about cannibalism. The thought process being at at the time that like cures like. 
So if you have something wrong with your blood, you drink blood. So if you have something wrong with your feet, you would eat a foot? Or is that not? Or like skin, you would ingest skin? So like if you had a skin condition somewhere on your body. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Chew on some tanned skin. You just chew on a skin book, yeah. Uh huh. So anyway, medicinal cannibalism was an accepted practice from the 12th through the 18th centuries. Only mummy powder from Egyptian mummies was believed to be legit, though people did sell a counterfeit version from any old recently executed criminal's cadavers. Which, what couldn't you do with a criminal's cadaver? No wonder people wanted their hands on those things, you know? How rude of the Anatomy Act to put a stop to that business. Yeah. It's like that movie with Daniel Radcliffe, Swiss Army Man. It's just a cadaver that you can use for anything. (laughs) Of course, this business now raises a lot of ideas about racism and classism. One example in an article I read compared the consumption of mummy powder to the ancient Roman belief that blood drunk from a gladiator's wound would also cure epilepsy. But because gladiators were usually captured and enslaved people, you get the sense of this social divide. And it goes on to talk about how the accusation of cannibalism was used to demonize people in the Americas and the Pacific, uh, something that we talked about in our very first episode. But Mm -hmm. white people have no problem eating the corpse of a non-white person. Although worth mentioning, as we had that whole conversation about transubstantiation, this is supposed to be one of the reasons why Protestants shit on Catholics. Yeah. Because Catholics were essentially practicing cannibalism through communion. In another article, a cultural and medical anthropologist from Vanderbilt is featured, Beth Conklin. And she calls that hypocrisy, obviously, but she made a comment, which again goes back to that conversation we had about cannibalism, that in non-Western cannibalistic practices, the social relationship between, I think she basically just summed up really well what we were trying to say, that the social relationship between the consumer and the person being consumed is important. But in Western practices, like these medicinal ones, the identity of that person is erased because it just doesn't matter. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, I don't love the concept of that, but I love how it was was written. I think we were kind of skirting around that without actually landing on it, you know, in our our conversation. That first article, it concludes with the comment that medicinal cannibalism fell out of fashion because attitudes towards human remains became much less palatable to the general public. And that reminded me, I can't remember which episode it is, but there is an episode of Bones where... Dr. Brennan is talking about it's the one where they go see that weird morgue guy maybe the pirate the pirate episode with the finger bone and she Mm -hmm. makes a comment about how people who work with the dead are always pushed off in basements or annexes or you know places out of sight out of mind kind of thing because it's we still live in a society where people who do work with death or the dead are considered weird and other and it's true you know death is still ew we all do it i don't know why people are like yeah yeah i know that you know decomposition is gross because it's natural (laughs) it you know usually there's bugs involved there's stink there's fluids like i get it but it's also like who cares yeah (laughs) same time I mean, even look at, we we don't even work with the dead. We work with material culture of dead people. And it's so hard enough for us to get into a building that functions properly. Yeah. And people say, well, who cares? It's just a bunch of dead people stuff. Well, yeah. Yeah. They well, you care too. about You care about your stuff and you probably have dead people stuff in your house, like heirlooms. I sure do. I could look around me and point to a thing that a dead person had. Sure can. <laughs> did you know that mortuary science was my backup plan have we talked about no this? i did not know that yeah i think i know we've talked before about how when i first went to college i was going for forensic anthropology and then it was mm-hmm. like nope no squishy things thank you yeah i had a realization the other day that i'm really good with first aid things 
it's because Shannon thought he had tetanus and I was like going through this like checklist in my brain and I was like I'm really good with first aid things and I think it's because you know that uh function of anxiety that flavor of anxiety where everything is a crisis when it's not but when you're actually in a crisis you're like so calm and you know what to do and you can just get shit done and like and you're not freaking out yeah I think because our baseline is already complete panic all the time so when everyone else is in complete panic it's like okay we're at normal functioning now I got this it's weird and I and I had a realization that I think I'm fine with first aid things because of that but if it weren't a crisis like if I went to mortuary school and was learning how to embalm someone, which I wouldn't want to do anyway, because I'd just go to mortuary school to get a degree or, you know, the certificates. And then I'd be like, I'm not doing that ever again. I'm going to do my own, you know, natural kind of death salon type thing. But that wouldn't be a crisis mode. And so I'd just be like, you know, that's disgusting. Get it away from me. <laughs> no, no fleshy things. Um, same with animals, too. You had that squirrel that you buried. I don't want anything to do with that yeah. until it's a skeleton. You know what I mean? Two books were mentioned in that article. Chris, write this down. <laughs> Future book club books. The first one is called Medicinal Cannibalism in Early Modern English Literature and Culture by Louise Noble, which sounds very interesting. The second one is Mummies, Cannibals, Victorians. I have that in my to-read list. Do you? The second one. I do. Did you find yeah. it? <laughs> Did you find it research? No, I think I've had that separately. I don't know where. I think I might have had that from uh, the vampire episodes or maybe zombies. I don't remember. Oh, yeah. But it's in my it's in my notes on my phone because I don't really use Goodreads anymore. Also, Chris sent in a comment about the Agatha Christie book I mentioned a few episodes. Yes. It's by Carla Valentine. Cool name. And I know they had a hard time finding the forensic, the vampire forensics book the origins of an enduring legend by mark collins jenkins mark collins jenkins sorry yeah i don't know why that wizard jenkins in my brain (laughs) finally um if you like while we're off on this tangent about books if you're into nonfiction books about medical history which i super am i would like to take this moment to recommend ghost map by stephen berlin johnson about john snow and london's cholera epidemic can you read that slower just for me The, the ghost map Stephen Berlin Johnson. Stephen Berlin Johnson. Thank you. I also recently picked up a book on smallpox from the used bookstore in Urbana, but I could not tell you what that's called. Yeah, medical history is one of my my things. I think being a medical historian would be so fun. I know I have a book on cannibalism, but I didn't find it for our last two episodes and i'm not gonna find it now (laughs) just sitting here (laughs) anyway mummy powder had another use any guesses mummy powder yeah for dying things it's cocaine no i'm just kidding i was gonna Um, guess that too but (laughs) they were snorting it it was used to make mummy brown pigment Paint. I was right. Yeah. Which was really popular with the pre Raphaelite artists. One of the more well known paintings believed to have used Mummy Brown is The Last Sleep of Arthur in Avalon by Edward Byrne Jones, who, upon learning that it was actually made from mummies, took his tube of paint and insisted upon giving it a burial. Like, took it out to his yard, dug a tiny grave dropped it in we stand him we love him yeah <laughs> use of the pigment mostly i think that guy was friends with Rudyard kipling too just as a fun fact mm. use of the pigment mostly ceased in the 19th century because most artists got the ick after they found out but it wasn't until 1964 that the manufacturer stopped producing it because they ran out of mummies wow yeah they are a finite resource i'm sure yeah they probably also just couldn't buy more on the black market for a cost that would make it worth it yeah which you can still buy mummies on the black market today for the record sure please don't yeah they're people too we don't we don't 
we're not in the business of buying and selling humans. Sorry. No. I just had to get that out there. <sighs> if you ever go to a curiosity oddity fair, whatever type thing, and someone says that they're selling ethically sourced human remains, um, I don't buy it. There's no such yeah. thing. Unless you see the receipts. Yeah. Literally, do not trust it. Um, because most skeletons <laughs> are those of Native Americans or enslaved people. Yep. Or those who were institutionalized for mental illness. Yes. There's any sort of marginalized people that died could be their remains. Yes. And we talk a lot about criminal corpses too. And I think there are some of those, even if they were shitty in life, they're still people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mummification started in Egypt during the fourth, fifth dynasty around uh, 2600 BCE. It was practiced for well over 2,000 years. Nice. The best preserved mummies come from the 18th to 20th dynasties in the New Kingdom, including uh, King Tut, who we will talk more about later. The entire process took 70 days and was performed by special priests who had been trained in anatomy and specific rituals and whatnot. So they first removed the organs that decay the fastest, the stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines, which obviously went in their canopic jars and would be buried with the body. We all know from seeing the mummy, Evelyn's depiction of the hook being shoved up the nose and scrambled about to remove the brains. Um, the heart was left in the body as it was believed to be the center of a person's being, the seat of the soul, if you will. Then the body was covered in natron, which is a type of salt. And then they also packed some inside the cavities of the body to dry it out, like a beef jerky process. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> well. <laughs> we were just talking about how mummified remains are people too, Georgia. And then about how eating people is not right. Okay, but it's still meat that you're trying out the same way. I mean, to be fair. Oh. No. Then the natron was removed or washed off, and the body cavities were filled with linens to keep the uh, overall, you know, shape of the body, keep it filled out, and fake eyes were inserted. Mm. Like glass eyes? Yeah, I don't know or what they were made out of, similar. but cool. yeah. yeah, which, I mean, it's kind of similar. That I mean, we don't insert fake eyes, but we put those, like, caps over them to stop your eyelids from sinking in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the wrapping began, several layers, amulets and prayers were written between the layers for protection and a warm resin, uh, like we talked about earlier, would be applied. And finally, the body would be covered in a shroud, and then you have a mummy. Delightful. Lovely. Yeah. So. It's a lot of work. I know. 70 days. Yeah. The amount of labor for that. Is- yeah wild which of course is why it only happened to to royalty and important people but yeah to be fair in egypt obviously it's a very dry place uh most people mummified their people by just burying them in the sand right yeah so moving on to king tutankhamun himself 100 years ago just a little over November 4th, 1922. I could Ooh. talk for like seven episodes just about Howard Carter and the discovery of King Tut. Mm-hmm. I I won't, but I, I could. Like, this was my hyperfixation for a long time. <laughs> Howard Carter is searching the Valley of the Kings and has been doing so for about 15 years with the exception of World War I. And he had been searching for King Tut specifically for seven years he in one of his earlier excavations in the Valley of the Kings he found pottery with 
King Tut's cartouche basically on it. But he he was like, we don't have any record of this person existing. So he knew that there was an undiscovered tomb of a king somewhere. And he was hell bent on finding it. And his excavations were all funded by George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who was ready to give up. But Carter convinced him to hold out for just one more season. And he agreed. And Carter's team discovered the first step to the entrance of KV-62, which was an event that became quite influential in all of history and kind of in my own life. Like, this is what kicked off my Egyptomania as a child, which led some of us to become archaeologists, right? And they found it by the only place in this whole area that they hadn't looked they they used a grid they did it properly the only place i hadn't looked was an area under the workers camp and so he basically made the workers pick up all their shit and move it and that's where the step was wow and the step of course lead down the steps lead, led fucking hell the steps led down to a sealed door which was filled with rubble and sand and stones so that all that was cleared out and they were faced with a second sealed door bearing the royal impressions of Tutankhamun. But Carter was still worried that it had been looted as so many royal tombs were centuries ago, um, which is, of course, why the discovery of King Tut's tomb was so significant. It was one of the few royal tombs that hadn't been looted, which, I mean, technically it had been looted a little bit but only a tiny bit yeah. you know um the body obviously hadn't no been. and and it was looted contemporary to its burial more so than looted in, in, hundreds of years later mm-hmm. so on november 26 howard carter and lord carnarvon along with carnarvon's daughter evelyn who Evelyn in The Mummy is actually named after. And my D&D character, Marin O'Connell, is also <laughs> named after uh, Rick. <laughs> and later Evelyn. She is a librarian, after all. And a smuggler. Mm-hmm. She's both of them put together. <laughs> God, I love my D&D character. <laughs> Anyway, it's the three of them and an assistant named Calendar, like Marie Calendar. <laughs> okay. With two L's. <laughs> okay. They break a small hole in the sealed door because they weren't actually allowed to enter the enter yet. Carter didn't have the permits, but they were just so desperate to see what was inside. And so Carter sticks his head in the small hole and looks around and Carnarvon asks, do you see anything? And Carter famously replies with... Yes, wonderful things. Which, I don't know, just gets me every time. (laughs) This room was the antechamber and behind was a second small room, also packed with items, one made eat in the afterlife, and those two rooms took two and a half months to catalog. And finally, there was a fourth sealed door, which was the actual tomb. And I know there's a lot of, like, mixed press about Carter. Some people talk about him being a dick and... Like being really difficult to work for and everything. He I he did the archaeology. He documented everything as completely thoroughly as he possibly could, um, given, you know, resources and, and science and everything that was available at the time. I think he could have done a better job at acknowledging his Egyptian workers, but he was also very um like he got fired from a job previously because a bunch of rich guys came in and demanded a tour of a a different tomb and the Egyptian workers were like no sorry and the rich white guys started fighting with them and and Carter backed the the Egyptians the guards and he was like no they're doing their job and he got fired because he refused to apologize to the white guys so I'm sure like any sort of intellectual boss person is gonna you're gonna hear like they're gonna they suck or they're great yes 
I guess I think at the end of the day, from from what I have seen, obviously I was not there, so I can't say for certain. But from what I'm seeing, I think the fact that it's always just his name that we hear, I think that is true for all archaeologists still today that don't acknowledge their workers. I think it's more of the fact that he was the lead, not because he was racist about it. Mm -hmm. Because other things that he have done showed that he highly valued their skills, their labor, their knowledge. I mean, shit, no one's going to remember us on the excavations that we've done. This is going to sound terrible, but did you hear about the woman archaeologist who is getting really close to finding cleopatra's tomb there was a new that video that you sent me in february yeah yeah that was great i don't yeah. remember her name and i feel so bad um martinez yes martinez dr martinez yeah it's so exciting <laughs> only a woman could find cleopatra's tomb one of the guys who's been big on hapshetsut's tomb um he wasn't one of my professors. He was a classics professor at my college, Don Ryan. Mm. He was also friends with Thor Heyerdahl. I don't know who that is. You don't know who Thor Heyerdahl is? No. The Contiki guy? No. Are you being sarcastic? I'm not. <laughs> you don't know about Contiki? Hell no. You didn't have to study that in Anthro? Oh my god. Nope. He's the guy that, that made the boat and sailed to Easter Island prove that it could be done oh we never learned about easter island we never talked about it well we didn't either but it it was like um an example of experimental archaeology oh that would have been freshman year and oh my god (sighs) hey this is off topic but that guy was in the explorer club the my professor oh he's also friends with um who is the woman Sarah, the woman who was doing the mapping of Egypt from space, the LIDAR mapping. Oh, I know who you're talking about, but I don't remember her name. Sarah Parkak, maybe. I think that sounds right. She did like the TED talk and everything over it. I never had Egyptomania. He was friends with her. No, so you're just, just a Titanic girly. I sure freaking am. <laughs> Every book report from, like, second grade until eighth grade was about the Titanic. Or every, like, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. I had a little bit of Titanic, but mostly Egypt. One day I'll talk about the Titanic. I was into all of it, though. Vikings, Romans, Aztecs, Egypt. I was into all of it. Mm -hmm. Big time. Anyway, I realized the other day, that guy's in the Explorer Club, the Explorers Club, And yesterday, no, Thursday, I was reading through, well, I was looking for um, Tokyo documentation, and I came across a manuscript that was Moorhead's address to the Explorers Club. And I was like, wow, Moorhead and I have this in common because I've also given uh, a presentation to the Seattle chapter of the Explorers Club. And I was just like, oh, that's really nice. Made me feel really cool. One of the guys in attendance was the last guy to um, circumnavigate the Earth in a rowboat. He was jacked. Big boy. It was really, it was an experience. Uh, (laughs) It kind of doesn't feel real. (laughs) Um, Anyway. Tutankhamun was originally named Tutankhaten. Did you know that? No. Oh, okay. He was believed to be the son of Amenhotep IV who was the really crazy pharaoh who changed his name to Eknaten when he, as a pharaoh, abandoned Egypt's traditional polytheistic religious beliefs and established the monotheistic worship of Aten, the disk of the sun, which is traditionally associated with the sun god Ra. I did know this, the, the switch to monotheism. Yes. Yeah. And Eknaten says, nah, the Aten is the part that's responsible for life and creation, so that's the only part that matters. It's a little close-minded. He also moved the center of worship from Thebes to Amarna, which is why this part of the 18th dynasty is known as the Amarna period. And it's believed that Akhenaten's queen was none other than 
Nefertiti. Nice. Queen bee herself. Mm -hmm. So Eknaten dies and King Tut, well, Tutankhamun becomes pharaoh at only nine. And he does get a lot of credit for trying to put things right after his father made all these changes. But it's worth noting that he did have viziers and advisors, one in particular named I, who would be making a lot of decisions in advising him. And one of the first changes was his name. He changed his name from Tutankhaten to Tutankhamun, um, realigning his reign with the more traditional religious beliefs and restoring religion. And he moved the capital back to Thebes, just kind of undid everything that his father did. He was maybe the product of incest. No one really knows for certain who his mother was. Not Nefertiti. Uh, it would have been one of you know the mistresses. He also had a lot of physical ailments, a cleft palate, a club foot that required he walked with a cane. He had scoliosis, probably suffered from multiple types of malaria, as well as a ton of other theories about his health. Some of them are just theories. Some of them, you know, we can't be sure of. Uh, but they include hormone imbalances, epilepsy, and even Antley Bixler syndrome, which is a really <laughs> rare skeleton condition, skeletal condition. Shout out to any of you who know that term from another episode of Bones. I really like that episode. It's so silly. <laughs> a lot of these potential diagnoses are quite controversial. So there's a lot of scientific argument about what's going on there. He is thought to have been married to his half-sister, probably not by choice. Her name was Anuks and Amun, just like the pharaoh's daughter in The Mummy that Imhotep is trying to resurrect. Again, because of incestuous nature, they had a hard time bringing child to term. And Tutankhamun died at only 19 with no heir, and no one can really say what caused his death. Some people think it was an accident. Some people think he was murdered. Probably not. Um, some people think he was just really sick. I mean, he seemed kind of messed up, yeah. Curses. Curses! Were there actually curses placed upon Egyptian tombs? Technically, yes. But if you find translations of them, they are more comparable to no trespassing signs. Like, this is a tomb. Don't fucking come in here, you weirdo. Mm -hmm. No death threats, no spiritual torment. Just, like, be respectful, you dingus. <laughs> but... Legend says that Carter's pet canary was devoured by a cobra, the ancient symbol of royal power, right as he crossed the threshold into Tut's burial chamber. There's no evidence of this as Carter's canary was under the care of an acquaintance who had in turn given it to someone else to take care of. Mm -mm. Nice. But the press ran wild with the story regardless. So when Lord Carnarvon's death occurred only a few months later, stories of the curse really uh, were sensationalized internationally. And rumors say that Carnarvon's dog howled, then dropped dead at the exact same time that all the lights in Cairo inexplicably went out for a few minutes. And I haven't really seen any evidence about the dog, but I suspect that's bullshit. And apparently the power grid failed in Cairo constantly at the time. So it wasn't an isolated incident. In reality, it happened multiple times a day people just expected the it. dog barking might have just well dogs can really sense things you know what i mean so maybe there was some sort of like weird electrical current thing and the dog was like oh i can hear that yeah i can sense that and that's probably why but it didn't drop dead yeah no in reality we know that lord carnarvon's death was caused by septicemia mm, love it which he contracted after shaving over a mosquito bite that led to an infection Oh my god. We're really going to get into victims of the curse here. I'm going to go kind of fast because there's a lot of them, but fast forward a couple more months to June 1923, Philip Livingston Poe, who was actually related to our boy Edgar, went to visit Tut's tomb, contracted pneumonia, and died shortly after returning home to Baltimore after his friends all joked that he should be wary of the curse. It's the 20s. Everyone's dropping from pneumonia. <laughs> it's the new TB. In the 1920s? Yes. It was crazy. Respiratory disease was bonkers. <laughs> right? 
July 1923, one of the worst storms London's West End had seen was reported, and during which at the Savoy Hotel, Egyptian Prince Bey, his last name is Bey, I forgot the rest of his name, he was murdered by his wife, Marie Marguerite. To be fair, he sounded pretty abusive, but it was another Mm. story that the tabloids ran with, an Egyptian prince who claimed descent from the pharaohs, who had also recently visited the tomb along with his advisor, Hala Ben, who committed suicide shortly after. Sorry, Mm. he passed away. He passed away. (laughs) Sorry, Seth. The Earl's brother, Lord Carnarvon's brother, Audrey Herbert, who was only associated with the tomb through his relation to Lord Carnarvon, went inexplicably blind soon after the tomb was opened. For some reason, he thought pulling all of his teeth out would help him regain his vision. What? (laughs) That is not what I expected. That's terrible. Do you think it worked? (laughs) No. No. It did not. Instead, he also contracted sepsis and died only a few months after his brother. Rip. Then in November, a guy named Wolf Joel was one of the very first members of the public allowed into the tomb. He fell into a coma and died on a boat on his way back from Egypt. And he was only 30 and supposedly healthy and all that. I can't explain that. Also in November, another Evelyn, this one uh, of the Waddington Greeleys, visited the tomb, went back home to Chicago, and then committed suicide. Passed away. Sorry, passed away. (laughs) We're now in January 1924 in London, and Sir Archibald Ray, that's a Call of Cthulhu name, who had x-rayed No, it's supposed to be Reed. This is just a typo. Archibald Reed, still a Call of Cthulhu name. Mm -hmm. He x-rayed King Tut's mummy, suddenly fell ill whilst traveling. Not sure of the cause there, but I'm getting the feeling that if you're traveling around in the 1920s when vaccines were barely a common thing and the discovery of penicillin is still a few years out, then you're going to get sick and there's a higher chance it's going to be fatal. Yeah. I get sick traveling now like yeah like that i am shook that i have not gotten sick all winter especially with as much traveling as i've been doing but i definitely feel like it's gonna happen real soon and it's gonna be bad when it does happen mm-hmm. don't don't worry i'll get sick and then i'll get you sick because that always happens <laughs> yeah probably. <laughs> i got you the following month carter's friend professor lafleur another Call of Cthulhu name, he reportedly visited the tomb and then died of pneumonia in Luxor. This is a lot of people. Fast forward another eight months, we have Hugh Evelyn White, who was one of the first archaeologists to enter the tomb after Carter. He shot himself in a cab in Leeds after being summoned to an inquest regarding the death of a woman who committed suicide after her infatuation with him was one-sided and he rejected her. He allegedly wrote in a suicide note that he knew he was cursed. Mm. Sorry, they all passed away. (laughs) In uh, July 1928, another archaeologist, Arthur Mace, who was part of removing the stones blocking the burial chamber, he died after being sick pretty much since returning from Egypt. But that's also five years later at this point, so... Mm. In May 1929, another of the Herbert brothers, Mervyn, with a Y, who was present at the official opening of the tomb, picked up malaria, then contracted pneumonia and died. There was a lot going around in the 20s yeah. and early 30s. Remember, we talked about sleeping sickness was also going around at this yeah. time. Like, there was just so much happening. <laughs> yeah. The papers had kind of left off the curse stories after 1923, but this death is the one that kind of reignited the spark of, yeah. of the curse. Arthur's? Yes. No, Mervyn's. Mervyn's. Herbert. Yeah, one of the Herbert brothers. Yeah. Then the mystery of Captain Richard Bethel happened. Now, this guy was an amateur archaeologist and personal secretary to Carter and Carnarvon. And in November of 1929, he was found dead at uh, in his bed 
at the Bath Club, which was a fancy gentleman's club. Not the stripper kind, but the, the kind, you know, a gentleman's club. The kind where you the go and smoke kind. cigars and yeah. And you talk about how much you hate your wife and stuff. Yeah. The New York Times would run the headline, Tutankhamun's curse recalled by death, Richard Bethel, once Howard Carter's secretary, latest of 10 excavators to die. Headlines have really come a long way since then. Yeah, yeah sure have. <laughs> Especially in terms of brevity. Mm-hmm. 10 excavators, yeah. Yeah. Bethel's father, Lord Westbury, jumped from his seventh floor courtyard flat just four months later in February 1930. Which Damn. was, again, attributed to the curse. Obviously, uh, he passed away. This is a lot of dead people, Georgia. Yeah. With Bethel, I want to talk a bit about the theory of an author named Mark Bainan, who wrote a book called London's Curse, which I started reading, and it's it's such a struggle. The guy, I think, is also a bit of a nut job. Don't sue me. Mm. He theorizes that the murder of the prince, uh, Fami Bey, was the first of five murders credited to infamous occultist Alistair Crowley. Bruh. <sighs> okay. If you remember, I said he was murdered by his wife. Mm. And Mark Bainan argues that Alistair Crowley and the prince's wife had been acquainted for about 10 years prior to the murder and that he had talked her into it. Mm. Okay. Bethel and his father, which natural causes and then suicide, both were investigated and apparently found that they could both have been murdered, but nothing is conclusive. And then there are two other deaths that Bainan attributes to Crowley. And when the locations of all five are plotted on a map, they form a pentagram. Okay. But why? The demons. This guy starts off with the fact that Crowley had moved to London in 1887. And if you recall from the depths of your knowledge, that is the year before Jack the Ripper's killing spree. I do remember that, yeah. Being only 13 at the time, this may have sparked some kind of obsession or fascination with him. Crowley of Jack the Ripper. Mm -hmm. And then Egyptomania gripped Europe, and Crowley thought he needed to avenge the Egyptian gods who were big parts of his own religion, the Order of the Golden Dawn. And some people, including Bannon, this author, think that he believed the last two deaths would make him invisible. Ooh, did they? <laughs> no one ever saw him again. I don't think they made him invisible. No, no. Oh, no. no they sure didn't. Mm -mm. Um. We could probably do so many episodes on Aleister Crowley and the Order of the Golden Dawn and, and all that kind of thing. Because there's so much wild shit there. Most importantly, for me at least, uh, for their most recent album, Impera, Ghost, referenced a photo of Crowley for the cover art. Oh, nice. Everyone out there, if you don't already know, Ghost is my favorite band of all time ever. And um, I hope Papa 3 is resurrected soon. Anyway, all that being said, it's worth adding that Howard Carter died 27 years after the opening of the tomb. And if anyone would be the victim of a curse, you'd think he'd be the first to go. His epitaph reads, May your spirit live. May you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes, sitting with your face to the north wind, your eyes beholding happiness. Beautiful sounds really nice yeah it's pretty nice that's pretty good so that guy's crazy um i yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just thought that was fun. i'll finish yeah. reading that book one day and i'll yeah. give you a full book report but okay. it's so hard for me i have been trying to read that book since i went on my powerpuff girls trip to chicago that was mm. uh a year and a half ago it's that difficult to just for me to take seriously okay let's do a quick rundown of Egyptian mummies and pop culture. Okay. Obviously, The Mummy, most importantly. One of my all-time favorite comfort movies. 1999 version, because there is a, yes. a much earlier movie called well, The Mummy. Well, yes. 1930s, and... right? Oh my god, if you shut up for a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just clarifying. The Mummy is a remake. 
Okay. <laughs> and then we also have a remake of a remake. So mm-hmm. the 1999 The Mummy with all millennials sexuality summed up into one movie. Correct. Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz. Yes. And oh, what's his name? I don't care about him. He's bald. No, 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 no. Not him. Ardeth Bay. Oh, yeah. So the 1999 Mummy is a remake of the Universal Monster Classic, The Mummy, 1932, though there are hardly any similarities whatsoever. Karloff's Mummy does have some great moments, but as a millennial, I'm going to stick with Brendan Fraser. And then, of course, we have the Tom Cruise one, which was a remake of the 1999 one. And it was an effort to relaunch a Universal Monsters universe, Dark Universe. And I would have really liked to see where that went. Um, But because they did such a bad job with The Mummy, it just wasn't received well. Um, They canned the whole thing. And I'm kind of bummed because the way they had set it up, it kind of seemed like it was going to be like a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen kind of thing with Russell Mm -hmm. Crowe being um, Jekyll and Hyde. I thought that was really like a fun addition. And I think that Universal Horror fans and like fans of the genre of literature as well probably would have really enjoyed it. But like movie goers in general just didn't care enough and there's not enough super fucking nerds like me to have made it successful you know right also they didn't really market it like that if i had known at the time that that was the plan i probably would have been much more open to seeing it but i didn't know that i just thought it was a terrible remake at the time so i didn't see it in theaters or anything you know Mm. weirdly enough tom cruise i think was actually approached to play rick (laughs) o'connell that's how i feel about him as jack reacher (laughs) Yeah, also absolutely not. One thing I didn't know is that two horror legends were both involved with the 1999 script, but neither were involved in the final production. One of them being George Romero, who we already talked about, Night of the Living Dead. And the other was Clive Barker, um, who wrote Hellraiser, the Hellraiser movies, and also a lot of horror novels. Uh, My dad really likes Clive Barker. Uh, but they both of those scripts were like too dark and so they weren't you know I think they might have like taken little bits and pieces of them but they they were overall scrapped yeah for the more action adventure comedy romance that we now know and love for the general audience yeah the scene at the beginning this is like my Lord of the Rings oh Viggo Mortensen broke his toe here a uh, fun fact, but the scene at the beginning where Rick is being hung, mm-hmm. Brendan Fraser was actually being hung because he did all of his own stunts and that one went a bit wrong. The mechanism that it was supposed to like stop him from actually being hung failed and he actually was like strangling and had to be resuscitated. What? And that's why he's so fucked up now because he did all of his own stunts and well, yeah, destroyed true. his body. Poor guy. He is a national treasure. Scooby-Doo, obviously there's tons of mummies, most notably in the very first very first season. And then there were a couple more recent movies, including Scooby-Doo, Where's My Mummy? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not as cool as Zombie Island, which I can't believe we didn't mention when we talked about zombies. I was going to, but we talked for so long. <laughs> well, Zombie Island is one of the best Scooby-Doo movies I ever. used to be utterly terrified of that movie. Really? so terrified the other last thing i want to mention is bubba hotep have you ever seen this movie (laughs) no it's a classic you you need to do yourself a favor it stars bruce campbell from uh evil dead fame he is a guy living in a retirement home who thinks he is elvis and his best friend is a black guy in a wheelchair who thinks he's jfk love it and the retirement home is terrorized by this cowboy mummy who sucks people's souls out of their butts love it 10 out of 10 okay 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 it's the kind of movie that you just put on and have a glass of wine and are like yeah this is this is exactly what i needed tonight (laughs) 
yeah take a load off literally relax for the night (sighs) that's what i got about mummies oh my god that was amazing i feel like a learned woman well that concludes this week's broadcast i hope you've enjoyed it if you wish to stay in touch reach out to us at broadcast from the belfry at gmail.com or stalk us on instagram at broadcast from the belfry again i hope you've enjoyed our little show please rate and review and until next week stay spooky